Kia ora everyone and welcome to this Goodfellow webinar on rational prescribing in dementia. My name is Dr Grace Lee and tonight I have the pleasure of talking to Dr Phil Wood, who is geriatrician at Waitamata DHB. Over to you. Oh, thanks very much for inviting me and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, sort of something that's been dear to my heart for many years. Sounds a bit um, lame, doesn't it, to be interested in something that's like dementia, but actually it's incredibly interesting how much our registrars and so forth enjoy the chances of spending a bit of time in memory clinic and looking at the variations that, that one sees in, in dementia. However, dementia in primary care is a different story. It's an, an uncharted patient that you're often seeing. It might be obvious in some cases, but in fact, um, we've got to be wary as specialists that we don't in, expect um, that it's going to be as easy as, as we have. We get passed on a plate, people with memory problems. You don't, you don't. You might have to pick them up along the way and recognize them for what they are, even without sometimes people coming along with the exact question, what's wrong with my memory? So I thought I'd go through a bit of an outline of what we're doing here. It's a brief background and why we, why we are so interested in dementia. It is a huge driving force in geriatrics and it drives a lot of care needs in the future. Um, I'm also going to spend a lot more time than I'm used to on what um, prescribing issues are and why they're still important. Primary care is the biggest prescriber in dementia, not specialists. And the reasons are not because of there being a wonder drug for um, dementia, but because of the side, because of the adverse effects of the disease and the adverse effects of medications and so forth. I'd like to look briefly at some of the evidence about some of these medications and we'll finish off with some case examples so that you can um, sort of put them into context. But what I do really want to see is any, any questions along the way and we'll try to collate them and put them into some sort of order as we go along. Thanks. So really it's quite an important area because of the demographic imperative. The numbers of older folk uh, rising in proportion to time will probably peak in 40 to 60 years time, we're not quite sure, but we are living in the generation of the oldest lived New, uh, New Zealanders ever and possibly will ever be because there are other forces in the system that are maybe pushing things in the opposite direction, obesity um, that and other health and associated issues, cancer rates and so forth. But the number of people is important, but the amount we're spending as a nation, it, whether, we, we, whether we like it or not, will continue to grow. So we're talking about um, a billion, um, one and a half billion at the moment, and it's, rise, it's going to be rising to four and a half billion by the 2050s. Now, most of us won't be around in that stage, but it's our children that we're sort of thinking of. And as good stewards of our country, we've got to be making the best possible impact on that. So. The, the, the proportion of that group who we see in primary care are likely to represent what you see on the bottom diagram, which is a rough indication of the proportion of people who've got various, the various forms of dementia. Dementia is a sign symptom complex. It's like brain failure. It's like heart failure. And if you're a student in, in, in a university for medical school and a nurse, you'll be asked, what are the causes of heart failure? And you'll be expected to say ischemic, myopathy, and hypertensive, and various other um, causes. And in dementia, you've got lots of options, but the vast majority of um, uh, vast majority are going to be people with um, Alzheimer's disease. And I'm sorry, I just got myself out of place here because that bottom diagram is actually about the numbers of people in various parts of the sector. This sec, the sec, the slide here really gives you a rough idea. Now the other have been divided into all those weird and wonderful conditions and certainly not in proportion. That's the group that I see a bit more of and what I spend my time doing um, sorting out the, the, these other atypical dementias and the from the usual Alzheimer's or everyday common or garden forms of dementia. Um, and that's that can be tricky at times, but um, you know, usually we have to say, why aren't we saying it's a, 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 an everyday dementia with a variation? So when I say, you know, I'm at, I'm at a luxury position of having cases plastered on my plate, um, you know, person with a memory problem, maybe there's somebody uh, in, in probably about one in every four, one in every five people coming into a clinic actually have very mild symptoms and at what they want is possibly a reassurance or some idea that what they're doing is the right thing, right through to um, people was quite severe. And I saw somebody today who could barely communicate with me and recognize a family and that was the first time they'd noticed something was wrong. 
Um, wasn't a great day for me, I must say. Um, there was two people under the age of 65 who really hadn't been recognised and, and um, having had a dementia until the um, primary care team suddenly had this person arrive in front of them. So recognition is everything. Your nurses uh, and, and your, your own um, appointment system might actually be the first indicator. A failure to attend appointments, maybe um, somebody noticing somebody's makeup is not so well put on and maybe Mrs. Jones is not so attentive to her, to her situation and her attire and so forth. Um, and then somebody makes an observation that, that there's been a bit of problems with the memory and does a mocker or what we're doing at the moment is replacing it with an ace. I might get some time to talk about that with a mini ace. And noticing that scores are, are low and then goes on to saying, well, is it a delirium? Should we um, screen for um, a delirium and go from there, urinary infections and so forth? And then going on to a, a more sophisticated um, situations while scans. So there's quite a, quite a sort of hierarchy of information that you need to go through for this, recognising when you should be thinking about the condition and then knowing how far to go before um, you know, it gets, uh, gets a bit too, too complicated. So for us, the big issue nowadays is, is for me, and certainly in the, in, the, in the research setting, this is where a lot of our work is now undertaken, and that's to do with the mild cognitive impairment symptoms versus the Alzheimer's disease. And I think whilst we won't go into it, but mild cognitive impairment is defined on neuropsychological grounds rather than these sort of things. But we do take a big um, uh, deal of notice with that. If a person's got mild memory problems, but doesn't interfere with their daily activities, it's difficult to say they have a dementia. It's not saying it's impossible, but realistically, if you've got a cognitive impairment and that's memory plus other functions like speech and language, like thinking and remembering, like getting um, acting and anticipating and planning and developing and calculating and doing all the things that our brain does, communication, then if it doesn't affect one or more of those um, areas and it doesn't affect their lives, um, in a, in a realistic way, then you've really got mild cognitive impairment. There are little, there are a whole lot of other factors in there, and if you're struggling with this and you've got somebody who's desperate to define the difference, then that might be a reason for, for example, getting a specialist opinion. Um, it's certainly, um, in my private practice, I probably see a little bit more of that because the worried well have often money. Um, Alzheimer's clearly is going to be an impairment of cognitive function, thinking, understanding, reasoning, decision making, and so forth. But it does impair activities of um, daily living. Now, the challenge here is to say what are the normal activities of daily living this person might be expected to perform. For females who are in a standard model, house um, looking after the home, they might be expected to be doing the cooking. That one in every four of my families who see me, actually it's man who does the, the male in the family, the husband who does the cooking, but it is the one, one of the more sophisticated um, things. It's the most taxing to do is to organise and plan for um, activities and outings and so forth. So those things can, tend to be the first to go. Personality changes tend to be a bit more subtle um, and possibly a bit late. Judgment might be retained, generally it does in mild conditions, especially if in, insight is, is um, held on to. And then there's a, so and then it's a little bit of a downhill from there. So that is the sort of a potted difference from MCI to Alzheimer's disease. So the management, this is where it differs. Um, I think for MCI, the challenge is not ignoring it, but taking it seriously enough to say, yes, I see what you're talking about. Let's see how things go over the, over the next year or so. But you have an opportunity here to review medications, look at concomitant conditions, see if that's optimized, look at their lifestyle, maybe look at their um, mood, look at bereavement, um, maybe look at um, social isolation, loneliness and things like that, all of those things, exercise, lack of exercise, lack of outings, lack of interest, all of these things might be an opportunity to provide sort of a lifestyle advice. So around this comes the use it or lose it concept encouraging people to continue and push on. For diet and so forth, we really are, for MCI saying, you know, just lay off the um, neurotoxins, the alcohol, go for the good stuff, Mediterranean diet, oh, I spelled that wrong, um, 
lowering your fat, the omega-3 and colorful berries and things like that, the food, the activities, the exercise, especially brain and body together, walking groups, dance is the best example. Um, going into um, into um, interest groups with bambington and table tennis. Croquet is sort of there. I have to say that because my mother-in-law plays croquet and she thinks that's good, so I think that's good too. Um, Social and family networks are very important, clubs, churches, organisations and so forth. Try to stop, encourage, well, encourage people not to drop things just because they can't remember people's names. If they asked their age group how many people have troubles with remembering names, everybody, well not everybody, but most people put up their, um, put up their arms for that. An opportunity to think about the future planning. Uh, EPOA follow um, and um, look at maybe even think if the opportunity to rise about advanced care planning or advanced directives as I tend to like to feel that we should be suggesting um, and uh, following following up as necessary. I'm not personally, and this is where I stand a bit apart from many of my colleagues, I'm not personally wanting to follow everybody up after a year, every year. I wouldn't see a new patient after the third year. I'd have to just keep on doing follow-ups and replacing those who popped off and died. So um, I do keep the door open. Um, it is, it's very rare to not go through MCI and get dementia, but it doesn't because you've got MCI, only 12 to 15% per annum go on to develop a dementia. Just a quick question before we move on to the next slide. Um, there's a question that's come through with regards to statins. Hmm. Someone's read that they can potentially um, they've read somewhere that they can potentially slow disease progression. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's two sides to the story. Um, I personally think that statins offer more benefit than, than harm when it comes to cerebrovascular disease prevention and stroke. Possibly the reason why the um, incident rate across the Western world is dropping is because we've been so really good at um, cerebrovascular and cardiovascular risk factor management. So I'm, I'm in favour of using statins wherever possible. On the other side of the coin, there's this issue to do with a very low percentage. It's only picked up when the HPO data out of America was analysed that there was a signal coming through showing that a certain small percentage of people did have problems with the side effects of um, um, uh, statins. And it occurs, can occur somewhere, anywhere along the, anywhere along the management line of statins, uh, which could be years and behind. Mm -hmm. So it's a very tricky area. What I do to this and say to people, well, your risks are not there necessarily. I'm going to be immediately um, altered by stopping it. So therefore, let's see how you go by stopping it. See how we go for a few months and go out, go from there and replace it with an alternative if you feel strongly that it's associated. It, it, I tell you, there's no fixed model here and I think you have to play it as a you know, as you best you can on this because um, if you've got somebody with serious cerebrovascular risk factors and you're stopping statins I I think it's a, it's sort of difficult I, I'm, I encourage my patients to return to a variation on the statin theme. Great thank you. Um, there are some research centres around New Zealand including our own at the Auckland Medical School and there's one in Dunedin and Christchurch looking at the um, dementia prevention um, side of things, and that's a large cohort of longitudinal study. Got my advertisement in there, Grace. Yeah. Well done. Good. So medications, the answer is no, there are nothing specific. Despite what people will tell you, want to sell you, want to, um, there is no routine medication. Routine cardio and neurovascular risk factor management I've mentioned. And I would suggest you check out um, the, and think about anticholinergic burden now there is a site, a very good site out of um, um, uh, from Spain, from Spain, and the site actually puts together all the, the many um, cholinergic scales, anticholinergic scales that exist. A lot of medications have anticholinergic side effects, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, but some of them have definite anticholinergic side effects, and that's because that's the way that they're designed. I think the next site is going on. Um, oh no, it's not. It's actually I've possibly missed out that slide, but I was going to show, and we may show at the end uh, about what I'm, it's certainly in one of the cases, um, how that looks on paper and what it can do. I don't expect everybody to go to that site and do anticholinergic um, burden scales on everybody, but I think it gives a very good teaching tool and that's how I use it in my um, teaching um, and clinic and, and for the fellowship and so forth. So, okay, we've moved from the this, this sort of preclinical mild cognitive impairment to a now a degenerative process and when it can when can we diagnose it 
it's I think the most important thing you can do is take a good history. Um, usually it's slowly progressive. Although admittedly, the last today was a bad day. Somebody came along and said they noticed it four months ago, and I find that hard to believe. Um, but they, the person can hardly speak a word and, and common of sense to me. And you do wonder what people are trying to say. Are they trying to avoid it or what? I think sometimes people's lifestyles are very, very simple and straightforward, and maybe they don't notice this sort of stuff. Um, usually it's an older age group, but as I mentioned, sometimes it can be in the younger age group. Be careful in a younger age group because there's a lot of gotchas in there, and there's a lot of psychosocial stuff as well. And, and certainly with MCI, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty cautious. I, I tend to underdiagnose um, dementia for as long as I can get away with it, just because I know that if we actively treat other conditions, so con con concomitant depression, psychosocial matters, mm -hmm. we can get a can sometimes see some significant improvement. But it's usually memory and another cognitive domain. Now the enthusiasts amongst you might remind me that actually it doesn't require now memory to be involved. But I'd say, look, on common or garden dementia of the Alzheimer's type, for example, memory is always involved. There are some weird and wonderful presentations which don't, but perhaps if that's the question, specialists are probably the better place to go for that. Um, there's, it's also a diagnosis of largely exclusion, of degenerative dementia, especially of the Alzheimer's type, is when you can't find a better explanation. And you know, you've got to think about um, stroke, multi-stroke, cerebrovascular disease, occult, um, sometimes masked conditions, um, medications, as I said, previous head injury, alcohol intake, possibly in the future, future toxins and so forth. And that includes pee and um, the, the drugs of abuse um, or social, social drugs. Um, we're not quite sure what's going to happen there. Depression is probably going to be in there as well, and I'll talk a bit more about it. Uh, we treat whether we think it's the cause or not. We treat it um, actively. And of course, the big ticket item in primary care is, is this a delirium that's popped up? And often that might be the warning bells that um, a dementia is on its way because it's much easier to have uh, an episode of delirium if you've got a pre-existing cognitive impairment. So it's a a good space at the start. Treat the underlying cause if you can find it. It's not always easy to find a cause. Uh, UTIs, oh well, yeah, that's right. What are you going to? And and before you know it, you've you haven't found anything. But look, viruses. I think we'll see a little bit of delirium with the COVID-19 coming through. Could be quite dangerous in the older age group. I can see that um, it's going to be a, a, an interesting time. Delirium is a marker potential marker for um, the earlier stages of a dementia or an unrecognized dementia. So I'll move on to that. So now I'll, I'll sort of slip straight through to the pharmacological side because that's what we're here for a little bit. Um, the complications and the management of dementia um, are actually quite the, the big reason why medications are involved. And the intervention, that's intervention options we've got are a medication which was primarily designed to tackle dementia of the Alzheimer's type, and some of the original research that I was involved with back in um, back in the late um, 80s and early 90s um, in the UK used some pretty primitive anti-cholinesterase -colin um, inhibitors, which were quite toxic in some ways. Uh, um, Tacrin being a good example, but actually surprisingly, we were able to produce quite a clear signal that they were producing a, a modest effect in a minority of individuals. They have a positive effect on memory, mild mild effect on and psychotic symptoms. Sometimes behavioural management works out well. So it's always worthwhile to keep in the back of your mind that a cholinesterase inhibitor such as denepazole might be worthwhile under, under some circumstances to try to especially activate the apathetic end of the spectrum. Um, and it's a pretty safe drug to use as a few people have um, heart block and things like that. And to be frank, I've given up doing the standard ECG on everybody because it didn't seem to help out predicting who was going to get a problem. But if a person's got a known heart condition and a known heart block, be wary, especially if on a beta blocker and things like that. The cons are side effects. And almost always, they, they at least involve some elements of a gastrointestinal, nausea, weight loss, appetite suppression. So I tend to advise people to take a um, record of their weight on a weekly basis in a notebook. Um, and um, 
and and in, in that respect, I, I don't generally spend a lot of time advising about all the other weird and wonderful possibilities, um, sleep disturbance and changing the medication, scheduling around and things like that tends to be something that you plan for um, on report rather than by trying to preemptively. There's a lot of stuff to talk to people about. So yeah, what we go ahead and spend time um, advising about how to encourage tolerance to the medication starting at five milligrams, but aiming to get to 10 milligrams within within the second month. Um, if there's problems with um, side effects, nausea, weight, then throttle back, for a stop the drug for a few days and then try, go back to the old dose for a few days and then go up to the higher dose. You'd go through that three times. I usually say three strikes and you're out. Um, of that medication. We can use patches if that becomes a, um, uh, an issue where you really, really want to pursue the um, situation, but I don't tend to go to them very often. The real issue is that it's not very effective outside that group and possibly Lewy body dementia um, for multi, multi infant dementia, um, which is a, a particular condition in its own right in the frontotemporal group, um, sort of. Um, people with major behavioral problems, but generally don't necessarily improve. Doesn't stop people like me giving things a shot at times, but I'm pretty wary of pursuing them endlessly, that's for sure. Here's the effect um, on ADS cog placebo versus um, the three known, uh, the three most common versions. The donepazole is well up there in terms of its, um, in, in its mates. The error bars aren't included here, but they're quite broad, I can tell you that. But what we're aiming to do and what I do say is that we have a probability of improving the, non-specifically improving the, the cognitive effects of an Alzheimer's disease in four out of every 10 people. And that's a, that's a minority and in a, at a modest level. So we might be able to turn the clock back three, six, nine months if you were lucky. If you follow that curve on the top there, down, you will see it crosses at about the six to six months. But in some series, you can see a general um, drift of effect even after 12 mm -hmm. to 18 months. The longitudinal studies, uh, longer trials and up to 36 months out of the U uh, in America and of the Scandinavia settings um, were actually quite in <laughs> interesting in that there were very few people arrived at the end point um, at 36 months on the medication. And like we're talking to five to 15%. I think the Americans were much worse than the Scandinavians. Scandinavians, you know, did what they were told and, um, you know, got on and maybe didn't necessarily gain the benefit. But the other thing is to note how steep that placebo curve can be. Um, we don't think it's necessarily always that steep, but this was the series that I've usually show because it's a reasonable representation. And actually over the years, it hasn't been able to be um, changed that much. So 40% respond, the numbers needed to treat are gratifyingly low. Four is not a bad number needed to treat. In other words, you give um, um, four people, uh, four out of 10 people, uh, four, a number needed to treat is just like lower than antidepressants, for example. So in a way, it is worth your while, but don't pursue it endlessly and have a good, good reason to ask um, after 6, 12, 18 months, especially after 12 to 18 months, I'm asking people, do you think it's doing any good? Then the question is, what should you do? Should you stop it? And the answer is, well, I don't personally believe in giving ineffective medications um, for no good reason. Now, the no good reason question is, if you think it's emotionally a prop and it's doing them no harm, maybe that's worth it. But um, in many cases where I'm thinking that things are not going so well and there's no emotional prop, um, I'm preparing, to, I usually say, let's take it off and or wean them off over the next few weeks and then see how things go. And if things take a deep a dive outside the normal range of variation across a couple of weeks, then sure, we can pop them back um, on the medication starting at the five and up to 10 after a week. And we shouldn't lose too much. Probably do lose something, but I say to people, we shouldn't be losing as much. But to be frank, there's so much variation and day-to-day, -day, um, week-to-week um, stuff that I think you'd lose it. Um, lose any loss of effect inside that. So stopping uh, the medication often is because of side effects and you, from what you're telling me, you're negotiating between uh, the patient and yourself with regards to is this actually providing any further benefit? Yes, I mean I've 
by the time you get side effects in the first three months, no, I'm very rarely stopping because of side effects. Okay. Yeah, it's usually stopping at a six, 12, 18 months, two years, three years later when I meet them again for whatever reason, say, do we really think this is doing any mm -hmm. good? And the answer is, not sure. We, why are you taking it? And that's not why I say them, but that we ask ourselves, why were they taking it? And the answer is because we failed to stop it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm a bit of a follower of, of uh, you know, you've got a medication you started, you should be in position to stop it when you think it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. Don't think it's likely to be doing a lot of harm, but you never know. Some people actually gain a little bit of weight and a bit of something and the other be of feeling a bit better and not having a suppression. So there are some functional outcomes. People say it doesn't make a big impact on cognitive function and what's a few points on a cognitive scale anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree. Um, but there are some um, reasonable data which I think have an enough quality about them to say we have more we have more information in favour of the functional um, quant um, benefit versus that that doesn't. Um, quality of life, much harder to prove. Um, and quality of whose life? Um, is it the quality of the person with dementia or the carer and so forth? And what we do know is that doing functional scales and doing cognitive scales and hoping you'll get the answer from that as to whether it's providing benefit, be very careful to presume that. I actually find the test which we used in our original research and in the in the, in the um, original Dnepozor E2020 trials was on a five point scale. Do the, does the carer feel it's got better, um, markedly better, mildly better, possibly a little bit better, uh, no better and no worse, a little bit worse, you've got to be joking, this is awful. Um, and that five point scale um, was enough, like a Lockhart scale, um, was worthwhile using. And I tend to use that in my practice. So with this particular medication, it's one of those medicines that in primary care, we don't really prescribe a lot of. Do you feel that it's something that primary care practitioners should be gearing up a little bit more to prescribe? Look, I think a good primary care team um, where you've got people, a, a, a good, um, profile with your nurse and your phys physician, I think you should be able to prescribe these. I don't find it a problem in well-managed practices. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people get a bit blasé. The other thing I do find is people are not adjusting the dose upwards. We should be aiming for okay. the 10 milligram dose and you should be achieving that in the fourth to sixth week. And this is other good reasons why you can't do it. And I think it'd be nice to have it annotated why you didn't get up to the 10 milligram dose because that stops people like me trying again mm -hmm. and getting into how because I come along and say, well, why haven't you gone up the dose and give it a shot? Not because I think it's miraculously going to improve, but the evidence is quite a lot stronger for the 10 milligram than the 5 milligram dose. Great, thank you. Big issue is not the pharmaceuticals, but it's actually about the caregivers, and that's why I think the quality of life question mm. comes in. They're often old themselves, um, often vulnerable, have less physical and emotional mm. resilience, mm. but they have very good social engagement with the person concerned in general. It's not saying it somehow dementia improves bad marriages, but um, it does put a lot of stress on um, rocky relationships. And so you've got to be aware of that carer phenomenon, the carer burnout. And much of the burden does fall on that group and the adult children, especially adult female children from the person with the dementia. And they are the carer group in the, uh, of, the, of the current, uh, current uh, model. Um, so assisting parents with dementia, looking after their own family and grandchildren and all that stuff, it does become quite um, draining. And, you know, watching some of these families, um, not only the, the sort of the deflation that exists with the diagnosis and the hopes that people were expecting from their later life, um, thinking of 65 to 70 year old developing a dementia, it's quite catastrophic. I mean, you're you're talking. This is not going to be a, a great lifestyle. You thought about, you know, well, maybe in travel these days is not the thing, but certainly, you know, your ability to enjoy your life together might not be quite the same. People will often go straight into a bucket list at that point, and I don't blame them. And uh, get get on with um, enjoying life. Be wary of travel um, with people with dementia. Be careful to explore. Exp um, explain to them that the travel alone and time shifts and um, can be quite a, quite challenging. Maybe taking a break in Singapore, Hong Kong or, you know, Qatar, Dubai, um, 
South America somewhere. I mean, it's really just trying to work out how do you make that an easier travel arrangement. Um, they have to give up jobs sometimes, and they certainly have to give up some of their wishes and their dreams. Um, and that means um, there is a problem that um, there is a lot of pressure on that group. The voluntary agencies are still the major source of support at that level for carers, Alzheimer's Society, Dementia New Zealand. And all of those agencies, in my opinion, are underfunded. Um, and we, as, a, as a, a nation, need to seriously think about is that the best model we've got? Because it does tend to increase the probability of um, support being provided. And that doesn't cost nothing, that costs money. Carer support in the community is also expensive. Respite and um, support groups and, um, and uh, day groups and so forth are very important. Um, I think sometimes we get a sanitised version of what dementia looks like unless you're a physician, a nurse, um, a health professional knowing people with dementia. But the other end on end of the spectrum is that everybody goes and sees people in residential care um, and in private hospitals and sees a, a lot of folk lined up around the wall or whatever, um, hardly able to communicate or anything. And that's the worst end of the spectrum. In between that was something of the truth. And usually for, um, in, the, in the undergraduate teaching, we should give a few examples of uh, movies related to dementia. Um, Iris was a fairly sanitized version, but it's not always the case. And this is where the other big use of um, medications occurs is in the behavioral disorders. Mm -hmm. They are incredibly common. Admittedly, that the, the criteria to have a BPSD can be quite low, um, can be just irritability. Well, my wife thinks I've got dementia and BPSD. Caregivers with people with dementia also have to deal with the behavioural um, problems that lead to all those premature institutionalisation. Somebody was talking to me today and saying, well, the person doesn't want their loved one cared for in a distant um, um, community because they should be in a secure unit, unit, but they are causing havoc in a unit that's closer to them. And then you've got this question, what's best for the person and what's best for the unit? And the best thing for the unit is to have less challenging behaviours and so forth. Um, so it can lead to in-house elder abuse, which is awfully awfully difficult to deal with. Um, not, not deliberate, it's often unintentional by neglect. Sometimes it's deliberate and it's uh, physical, but often it's more, more subtle than that and it's um, um, psychological. Uh, psychiatric disorders and burnout in carers is a phenomenon that we care for and note, and it certainly occurs and you've got to be wary of long-term care facilities. Um, they are very difficult places to work with, and I think people who work for um, relatively small amounts of money in the long-term care industry, especially dementia units, are well worth their pay. It mm. is a, not an easy circumstance. Um, yeah, it's a confused, um, working in a, com in a com with a confused brain in a very confusing environment, which is all over the show with other people who are confused. It's not a great place to be. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, we start to think um, we've got to solve the behavioural problems. And the behavioural and psychiatric manifestations of dementia are quite, um, quite common. And we'll mention them and, and, and list them in a minute. But they're, they are not just bad behaviour. They're actually reflecting um, a cause. All behaviour has a reason. It's just that we're not sometimes able to understand that. Mm -hmm. Unmet needs, pain, medical problems, um, boredom, um, abuse, um, feelings of your um, personal space being invaded, um, can't find the toilet, um, don't know what a toilet looks like, um, what's a toilet anyway? Um, and then there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on there. This is the big driver in the, in the sector. Um, especially in the long-term care sector, and any of you looking after those in the long-term care will be all too aware of this and the difficulties it um, provides. So this is the sort of etiological contribution to be behavioural changes. Um, some of them are modifiable and some of them not so readily modifiable. Um, you, you have to sort of try to work between this and find out what you think you can do. So here we go. The first approach is, and the most common approach is used the ABCDE approach. What's the antecedent behaviour? What's the behaviour itself? Be more specific. What exactly is the behaviour? What's the consequences of that behaviour? What happens 
does somebody attend to the person who's calling out and stroke their head and their shoulders and give them a cookie or, or give them some attention and it stops and then you go away and the behavior starts again well it's a reward cycle going on what's the what's what do you think is the cause then what's your diagnosis i try to think of this in abcd so to find a word for d diagnosis and what's your experiment going to be what's your experiment going to be what are you going to do and how are you going to know it's um it's effective um, so the other approach is this, uh, as described on the screen here, it's all more about describing, analyzing, treating, and evaluation, same as what I've said. BPAC has some very good data, um, information out of, on, in, on, uh, on their publications on this, and I strongly think if you're ever having to look after that group, it's a good way to get some quick CME and CNE points because you will meet it again. If you've met it once, you will definitely meet it again. Complications, therefore, are the psychoses, the delusions, hallucinations, mood disorders, and the challenging behaviours. Some of these, I'll, I'll note, there is no hope that you're going to be able to give a medication to solve these. And you shouldn't, because um, to get them to be improved, you'd have to put the person at risk of falls or asleep to, be, you know, to sedate them to so severely that they won't wander around. I mean, it's... No, it's easy for me to say, and I understand how these things grow, and you have to find a solution, and the team are looking at you, um, the prescriber, to come up with a solution. I understand, can see how that happens. I've been there, but not as often as you guys are. So case-by-case case issues, psychosis, delusions, hallucinations. Treat as the need arises. You might have to give a short course, maybe a week, two weeks, month, two months of medications for this. and um, look, try, try to avoid treating things which you you see as being important to everybody else, but not to the person. Mm -hmm. They have these visions, these they hear these things. Are they worrying them? I often listen to people and say, oh, tell me about your hallucinations and what do they see? They see something crawling over there or somebody, there's a little children and they're trying to get in the door, but we don't know who these children are. Why are they there? Um, as opposed to those people who are coming in and they're trying to attack me and this is not my wife, that's a much more agitated approach from delusions, hallucinations. Um, that might well be treatable. Um, however, to treat every um, um, every uh, delusion and every hallucination with an antipsychotic, for example, I think is a bridge too far because many of my folk who have hallucinations are quite... I have them. It's like a dream, and you know you have them, and they may be not just necessary or not always disturbing. The other thing to be wary of the Charles Bonnet syndrome: low brain, low brain, and low vision interaction. Um, so the vision is the primary issue, and people. I don't know if you notice how many things people can see in the snow and in the moon and on the skies and the stars. They make, we make up things. Our brain is designed to find insights and and um, explanations and and what we see and. Charles Bonnet is the extreme of that um, somewhat disordered brain vision coordination. Auditory hallucinations should make you possibly think a little bit more about Lewy body disease, and that is another good reason to think maybe we should, if we haven't already tried cholinesterase inhibitors, this is an area where they may actually prove to be a little bit more effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting areas in that. Mood disorders, depression, anxiety. Now, I'm I'm looking for evidence for depression, and I rely heavily on our primary care um, information to um, suggest that if you feel there's depression in the face of an early dementia, or certainly with mild cognitive impairment, I would strongly recommend you give a hand up with the SSRI, um, but also look for in a mild cognitive impairment. Think about, is this person uh, um, capable of doing a little bit of CBT, positive thinking, uh, mindfulness, that sort of stuff, um, because the very mild cognitive impairment with early depression, it can teach them skills that they need in the future. So I'm trying to teach people, well, trying to suggest to people, this is not a handout in terms of medication. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make you less depressed necessarily, but it's going to get you an opportunity to make the most of your brain cog your power to think positively and, and get over, get up, get out, get, right, get moving type stuff. So the this, this frequency is high, 10 to 20%, and it can occur both early and late, it can be the first sign of a dementia as well. So you've got to be careful with that. And for SSRIs, we just tend to watch out for 
hyponatremia and interactions with us, certainly with the older tricyclics. I don't tend to have ever used them, but yeah. So what common medications would you use in this space for the elderly population? Um, I'm almost always first reaching for um, SSRIs in the first instance mm -hmm. or mirtazapine if there's anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now every practitioner will have a favourite and every psychiatrist and every psychogeration has a slightly different bias. And I tend to listen around for good reasons, um, but you often find it's more personal mm -hmm. than, than it is to be than published data. If you feel something, you understand a drug and you know it well, my advice is that you tend to use that first and you know when you when to pull out and change change ranks and go to a slightly different variation on thereof. We'll move on to the next part, which is perceptual disorders and retardation and apathy. Not likely to respond to pharmaceuticals at, uh, um, unless it's severe depression that you're treating. And I have on rare occasions considered um, at talking to, and we've talked to our psychiatric, uh, psychogeriatricians, and I've been involved in psychiatric care, care in, the, in the secure units and so forth, and having to debate the benefit or there um, by which way, you know, no effect of any other medication. Let's consider um, ECT. And it has been effective, um, surprisingly effective. Mm. So never discount all the range of potential for this retard, retard, psychotic retar retarded depression end of the spectrum. Um, and they may have a coincident dementia. Um, same thing with schizophrenia and so forth. The graduates um, come through, they've got a high probability of dementia, um, presumably of an Alzheimer's-like type, but um, challenging behaviours. Um, agitation, um, catastrophic re reactions, um, they possibly would be a little uh, more attentive to the uh, antipsychotic, the atypical antipsychotics, but generally the best advice is to go for a non, uh, non pharmacological treatment first. Try to find out the reason why people are doing this. Um, be wary of trying to stop wanderers, um, unsafe walking, um, because you really do have to sedate people heavily to stop a, a walker from wandering. Um, it, and I think, to be frank, the best thing to do is allow them to walk in a safe environment. Safe walking is better than treating wandering. Aggression and uh, aggression is put in there twice because it's so important. Um, and I think under those circumstances, you really have to try to understand a little bit more. Is it separation that you need to undertake? Do you need to have some way of um, managing that? Aggression against a husband or a wife or another member of the family? You've got to talk about, um, try to get them involved in care education and talk about distraction, diversion, as early as they start to see the signals coming through that something's going to go up, um, go to turn turtle. Often the sort of sundowning syndrome. Screaming and calling out, we've all talked out, non-pharmacological approaches, inappropriate urination and defecation. Sounds ghastly, and it is, but you, invariably there won't be. A, a pharmacological approach for this in my experience. If anybody's got some examples, I would love to love to work with that because it's it's unusual in my experience. Wandering and some unsafe walking we've talked about. Um, you know, going into somebody's room and disrobing and trying to get into bed with them, pretty troublesome environment. You're probably going to have to find a way of diverting that or uh, getting around that. The, the big issue is trying to negotiate with uh, families about why this sometimes happens and it's um, hard to lock people's doors mm -hmm. and so forth. So, I mean, most most facilities have experienced nursing staff to help handle with that, but medications might damp things down a little bit. So the interventions, the pros and cons here may stop hallucinations, but unlikely to stop delusions, may reduce some behavior, especially those with agitation. Um, cons are sedation, falls, and the evidence is now quite clear that long-term use of these antipsychotics, including things like risperidone, and I think haloperidol escaped it because it missed out being, being a, a new enough drug to be monitored, um, is, is that it increases the risk um, of stroke and um, early death from cerebrovascular disease. That's a modest effect. I don't personally take that as being a reason I don't prescribe. I don't prescribe because of the falls issue mm -hmm. and the tardive dyskinesis, is dyskinesia is the Parkinsonism. By the time you're getting that, you're getting into deep water and you probably want a, a, a psychogeriatrician if you can find one um, to help you out there. Um, I see quite a big proportion of that in my service, of course. Sedatives, benzos, uh, you know, I, I am occasional prescriber. Um, um, and that's because they are 
reasonably easy to, and safe to stop um, quickly and they are very effective but don't expect them to um, suddenly um, um, you know make the person well behaved in the, for the future be wary of sedation carryovers the hangover effects and so forth um, the, the morning after type problems of people looking a bit drowsy I've had people come into my clinic who've been started on um, benzos or antipsychotics and you think why did they give the full tablet when half would do and uh, actually one of my colleagues I'll, I'll give this story because it's interesting one of my colleagues said um, the, the lowest possible dose and I thought oh, well, I will take give a single tablet he said no what you do is break up the tablet into four portions give the three greater portions to the carer and then give the one portion smaller portion to the patient yeah. I don't know, it's meant to be a joke you're meant to be laughing um, anticonvulsants. Now, up to 10% of people can develop um, um, a convulsion and uh, 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 have an epileptic episode in some stage of a dementia, but they won't always be dangerous grand mal collapse and fall um, types of conditions. They might be quite subtle, um, might be just a bit of a blank period. Um, so they're quite modified. Yeah, it's hard to get a, a, a good it's hard to see how a um, normal convulsion can occur in a brain which is so thinned out mm -hmm. and its connections are so poor and that's why possibly it's so modified. But we have a bit of a nose for this as it were for geriatricians and, and so forth but sometimes I'm saying I don't think that behaviour that you're seeing is necessarily purely a behavioural thing and maybe we think of it as epileptic and, and what we do is use an anti-epileptic. And I mentioned carbamazepine because it's an old slide but we're actually using quite a lot of lamotrigine and I'm a bit of in favour of um, you know the, the old uh, of the old school pharmaceuticals but lamotrigine seems to be um, uh, slightly easier to use and slightly safer. Lithium rarely used can be seen. I, you should, we should be leaving this to our psychiatrists. Um, complicated depression. Um, be wary of that. So, yeah, how are we going? So, um, I'm also going to describe some pretty classical situations. These are carefully crafted to come up with the answer. Um, but Joan is an 82-year-old who lives in an independent unit of a residential village. Now, this is not a long-term care facility. People who mistake a residential village for um, an, an, an ARC or a long-term care um, sector is, it does make it difficult for people like to me. Do you mean they're living in a residential care service um, or they're living in a gated village licensed mm -hmm. to occupy? And sometimes that for me is like, oh, so they're living alone in an independent unit in a licensed to occupy village. Mm -hmm. This is club med for the elderly. That's right. And so, um, so really that means that she is quite likely to be enjoying her social activity mm -hmm. in our society. She's taking the advantage of those environments. She's extracting the value that she's put into it financially, um, the cost she's put into it financially to get the value of that. Great for social um, engagement. If you're a social person, possibly the sooner the better is in my experience that you, you've, if you've got the funds to do this. The sad fact is not everybody can afford it. So Joan has a gradual deterioration in her memory over the last couple of years and only has in the last six months received increased support from the family from some elements suppose for example financial management making sure that the the, the, the um, license to occupy fees are, are, are being paid and important appointments are kept up to date and usually somebody's keeping an eye on that um, one of the family usually is taking takes priority and does that but she also has some minor difficulties with worth finding recall of names and some repetitiveness um, sounds like me um, and her family are encouraging to seek an appointment now I see a like remember this is licensed to occupy so this is a person with money so this is a high likely presenter group this is a high proportional presenter group especially to primary care and eventually to secondary and specialist care they want to know and they know about Alzheimer's disease and it's the thing they fear most next to cancer mm. yeah so like to see that you got your fingers on the buzzer and you're, pointing, you're typing away merrily. What do you think we should do? Do you think they should do anything? Well, it looks like her family have encouraged her to make an appointment to see the device, so yeah. we should be picking things up in primary care. Yeah, you could do, and I'd agree with that. I think the first step is the simplest steps, the straightforward, is there something else going on? I mean, she's 82. She might have other health conditions. There might be other reasons. Mm -hmm. Has she lost a friend who... Um, 
I mean, you go to a license to occupy, people will die around you. That's true. And it's not a happy family place necessarily. And I often get to hear of this sort of secondarily that mm -hmm. um, I've lost all my friends, they've passed on. And even though I come into a village accommodation, I'm the last one standing. Now, or Sarah, that's something to that. So mood disturbances, I think, are important. So let's have a look at this. I think the answer is often in the history. You will be able to do a cognitive test. Um, that's not the issue. It's not the question. It's actually more important to know all this other stuff, um, events, lifestyle, environmental stuff. Is the per Are you able to get an indep independent perspective of that person from a carer, especially a loved one who's visiting regularly? We tend to prefer um, a family member who's well engaged with the person. Um, and occasionally there's no such person and we end up getting one of the care assistants coming along and they're sort of part-time staff and so forth and it's never satisfactory. Medical vascular depression, anxiety, history, bit of a, a, a worry wart in the past is likely to be a, a continued worry wart in the, for the future. Um, and then look look specifically at the type of care and support that's being provided. Sometimes you find it's sub, sub, almost illicit support. It's being you know provided underneath the radar and you don't realise how often the person is actually not cooking for themselves mm -hmm. and they are getting meals, oh, they throw some meals, but they use the microwave and, you know, they've managed to do that. So is that cooking? No. Is that, oh, I can't be bothered cooking. I don't like cooking. But it's very unusual for a person who's been a cook to suddenly become disinterested. Not saying it's impossible. I became disinterested after cooking for a week. And so consequently, I think you've got to, you, you're got you the best people to judge on some of those matters as best you can. How long has it been taking? Then you've got time to go through all the stuff that looks at um, delirium and checking blood tests, the thyroid function, the, um, the urea and electrolytes, the liver function tests, if the booze has gone up in the long-term care, look at the how many empties can people find and can you find a care assistant who can tell you that. Um, that sort of thing might give you an indication that there's something else afloat and it wouldn't be the first time that somebody's had a mild problem with memory and primary care has gone and done the, the right thing and discovered a few anomalies that needed to be explained and frankly, Primary care is much better than the specialist. I start thinking the worst whenever I see um, abnormal blood tests. So do the routine use and ease thyroid function and calcium if necessary. But you don't have to do any of those if you feel that it's really clearly not indicated. You've done it 15 times before, 10 years ago, and you've got no intention of starting a, a um, statin, you know, that sort of stuff. Why would you do the lipids? Um, so you, your, your, your intention is obviously more important there than us. The question now is um, to do or not to do um, a CT scan and so forth. The, the rules have changed. There was a time um, up until a few years ago then everybody at some way in a pathway was going to have a CT scan. I sort of feel in a secondary care and a special environment, I'm obliged almost to, to make sure I can see one. Personally, and this is personal, I prefer an MRI. And you'd say, of course you would, you're a specialist and you've got, they've got lots of money. And the answer is the difference in price is not that great. So you might only save a couple of hundred dollars by going for a CT scan. The price is in the reporting as much as it is in the product. So, and it's a hell of a lot better to use. So keep that in mind. I tend to prefer to request them myself because I'm asking specific questions and I'm pushing the neuropsych um, and radiologist to be a bit more specific and asking for scoring systems that we are used to using in research. And I'm current, I mean, you might see immediate temporal scores and global atrophy scores and things like that. That's a signal for, um, um, for for people who are looking for evidence uh, in the future of, of um, maybe risk, risk risk adjustment and so forth. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. there's a question that's also popped up. Yeah, yeah. For straightforward uh, dementia, is a CT necessary? Somewhere in the, in the cycle, I personally believe so. Now, if you get a 95-year-old, you've managed to make a diagnosis of dementia and and there's no, it's all followed a normal pattern. I can't mm -hmm. see any great advantage. The probability of picking up anything but an incidental, um, a, um, out of the ordinary um, issue is, which is of no help to you, in other words, often provides more of a confusion than help, is quite high in those circumstances. I am not um, always requesting a CT scan in all of my patients, even in a memory clinic these days. So if that's your, if that means I am choosing but I also know how many times, and I can count them, every one of them, 
how many times I've been told a few weeks, months later that the person's come up with a frontal tumor or, or right. you know what I'm saying? Yep. It's, it's, I, it I, is, I, that is the risk. And yep. I think it's small. The price of a CT scan is relatively modest. It's 10 minutes. It's hard, it takes longer to get on and off the table than it is to do the scan. I think for us as primary health care practitioners, it's often really access, to be fair, yeah, in terms of sure. getting access to any sort of imaging on that scale yeah. um, and locality to service for our patients. So yeah. that's the sort of yeah. the issues that we face in primary care yeah, for that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the northern sector here, the Auckland metro region, there has been a general rule at some point in the, in this, in the, in this, in the pathway a CT or other brain imaging is expected. That's been moderated recently and it's been diluted and many of us don't disagree. I used to use what I call the Canadian and um, some of the um, other um, jurisdictions um, where where there was where you felt that it was going to potentially make a distinct mm -hmm. difference. Um, and I think that's a very broad question and I, you know you can drive a truck through that. Yeah. Make the diagnosis be, um, and you can be careful. You can say, uh, we think it's mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. um, and you can afford to be on the, on, you can afford to stand on the fence on this one. We'll see how things go over the next few months, days, weeks, years, whatever it is you choose to use. And I certainly do that with people. And I have to then live, get to help them live with uncertainty, mm -hmm. especially if there's behavioral traits that are abnormal. Um, most of the time, I'm trying to moderate people's expectations of what a diagnosis offers. It is sure. purely a description with medical terminology. I think for you in primary care, the challenge is knowing when to refer and how often to refer. Mm -hmm. And the answer is um, basically um, we'll go through this in a few minutes time if we don't go through it again, but I'll shorten it now to atypical presentation, onset, age, duration, and um, leave it at that. I think anything that you don't feel comfortable with I think is fair game. That's what we're here for. That's our job. We're spe that's our that's our job to make the primary care mm -hmm. give you an opinion that you can work on. It's not for me to tell you what you can or cannot feel comfortable with. Um, it's, it, I know that we're trying to upskill you, not because we want less. It's because we want you to feel more engaged with that and not have to hand everything on. Big issue nowadays is the question of whether we would be better to run a dementia or diagnostic service. And I would say, please do not do that because it compartmentalizes everything to the point that nobody becomes really competent to look at the mm. whole person. And uh, I'm not in favor of that. I know some services expect to see everybody. I personally think that's not necessary. I also think it's a, a, bit, um, a bit demeaning of primary care. Look at the medication management, both in deprescribing and prescribing. Give the lifestyle advice we talked about before, and there's a condensation of that, uh, as I mentioned before. You, they deserve a sensitive explanation. It is not always easy to make it um, feel, make people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, it's not a nice condition to say. Uh, you know, I had a Korean couple this afternoon. I'm talking through an interpreter, the family members, um, son and daughter, both speak very good English. The person with dementia can't speak very good English and they're a bit, they're a bit adrift from everything. And the, and, and you'd say to the, the this lady, whose wife, this man you married um, and now is 64 and re having to retire early, has a dementia. You're in a foreign land, effectively, yeah. um, in a in a situation where suddenly this guy is not going to be around very much um, to help you and poof, no. Korean is not good because it's such a social disadvantage to have anything cognitive mental going on with you. So, so try to find a way of doing that sensitively. I've never found a way that was completely, um, if it's not able to cause a tear or two in some ways, I do wonder if it's um, understood. Uh, understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Information. Uh, about services, dementia um, uh, services and local services. To, um, try to allow them time to get to grips with it. The question of then is this, oh, this navigation issue, what are they going to do? Well, a lot of services don't have access to somebody who knows about mm -hmm. dementia and give that personal information. It would be great to have a person that can go and see it back to each and every person about the diagnosis and all about it. The feedback we can get, get from that when I've, we've done a bit of that was, I didn't like that. It didn't seem right for me. Mm. And they were it's too early. They were too raw. Too they wanted life to go on as usual. Mm -hmm. They they want to put it to their side and get on with it. So 
carefully managing information, carefully expecting people to go and rock up to every educational meeting, I think is the other thing, but providing continuous opportunities for them to choose that, I think is the thing. Managing comorbidities, risk management as per usual. Um, talk about getting, especially early as possible, EPOA in place, um, because this is such an advantage for them in the future. Not, it might not suit everybody, I concede that, but I think that's for them and their solicitor advice. Mm -hmm. It ain't cheap, we're talking three to $500, but if they can combine it with conveyancing of property and things like that, then go for it. Driving is a big ticket item, and I think we've just done stuff on that, haven't we? Yes, yes, we have indeed with our case. So uh, those of you who are interested in further information on that, head over to our web page on our cases, and mm. you'll be able to find out more information. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. So, and then the medical legal issues of um, making sure that they've mm. got a um, will sorted out and any other things that they're trustees on the family trust, you've got to make sure they've got succession plans built in, that there's a voting schedule sorted out. So because I... I I spend a lot of my time trying to convince the, well, not me personally, but the High Court being convinced that mm -hmm. this person is not suitable for the job. And, you know, it's a waste of personal, a waste of people's time and actually their money and a waste of the High Court's um, time to do this stuff. Colin Estrays inhibitors don't offer much of a hope in the mild cognitive impairment, but in this sort of situation, I would be seriously considering them, talking about their risk benefits and um, considering um, a short trial if you've got the opportunity. Okay. So we're at 8.32 now, so we've got a couple more cases, so yeah. about 15 minutes more to run with some well, Q&As in there. Okay. Right, okay. So this is a guy that's living at home and he's got, um, is with his wife and he's got into some problems um, with mild heart failure and so forth, and he's waking at night and thinking there's intruders and he's disturbing his wife's sleep. His medication list is not unusual. It's a bit out there a little bit. I've carefully managed it because he's already been treated for hallucinations mm -hmm. and night disturbances with some quetiapine. And so this is where I can produce the, this question of cholinergic burden, anticholinergic burden. And that's the sort of this is a sort of um, uh, output you get from the tool that I mentioned, this uh, a Spanish outbound uh, tool. If you do want to go to it, give it a shot. You do have to log in and join it, but I think um, it's actually not a well-managed, not a monitored site, and it's a site for teaching, as it were. But if you want to go to it, this is what it gives. But you can see the big ticket items about which of those medications have high anticholinergic burden. Now, some of them you'd say, well, that's because they're meant to be, such as oxybutynin. They're meant to slow the bladder down. Well, they do that through an anticholinergic mechanism. So surprise, surprise it comes up with a plus. But amitriptyline, which you wouldn't necessarily think is a primary anticon, you're thinking is keeping it, helping with sleep or pain and things like that. Well, on Monday, I saw somebody in the clinic and um, I spoke to him. Um, he was the, the husband of a patient of mine. And he said, I'd like to talk to you about, I'm feeling absolutely ratchet at the moment. And I'm, excuse me, feeling bad and completely um, worn out. I don't know. Marilyn has not changed. She's, you know, it's, I don't know. I just can't carry on too much. And I said, so what's changed? And he said, oh, nothing much. And I said, he said, oh, it's just me arthritis and so forth. Been started on um, mm -hmm. a low dose of doxepin. And I said, look, let's see if we can stop that and see if that, but it was a high dose, 30 milligrams. So a little bit more than what we're expecting here. Do that and you'll be surprised. Have a serious ask. Do you need them? Is there not a better alternative? Even didoxin and might have a very low risk, but they still have a mild anticholinergic burden. And then you get all these scores. You can get a score coming up, and you get a high risk score, and it's just an addition of what we call the uh, the um, the combination, how avid the, the 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 agent binds onto a cholinergic receptor, and this is their um, cholinergic receptor avidity scores added up, and the dose. And then you get all this, you get the pattern sorted out. So it's a good example of you can still do it in your head, um, but it's actually nice to do it when you're sort of thinking about it. Finally, um, Lily, she's 78, she lives with a husband at home, and she's had a diagnosis of dementia for a year or more. Um, out of character behaviors, came out um, repeatedly asking for information on what's happening today. She's out there purchasing by herself and she's buying lots of stuff she doesn't need. And she's been to the local um, toilet paper auctions at the at the um, at the supermarket while the COVID virus um, is going on, and she's come back with some expensive toilet paper. 
and wandering and security is an issue becoming argumented and irritated. She's in accusing her poor husband of infidelity, which she's is absolutely mortified with, so are the family, and she occasionally thinks he's um, her father. Why would she think her, the husband's her father? Sometimes people say this is really bizarre, but actually he's just an older man mm -hmm. who looks like somebody I would relate to, older man who I relate to, well, but shouldn't be hopping into bed with me. That's my that's right. father. And so um, this becomes an issue because compartmentalizing of memory means that your male mates, your friends, your family are put in a similar box and then subdivided thereafter. Hierarchical memory. So, you know, it could be that that's causing a problem. So the explanation of that sometimes is enough to defuse it. Mm -hmm. It's not like he's, she's become argumentative or that this guy is hopping into bed and he can't relate to his partner like he always has. And so you try to find a way around that. Sometimes it still doesn't make a difference to her, but it might make a difference to him. And that's the real important thing here mm -hmm. in going from there. Looking at a way to reduce that and maybe looking at it and, and making a um, discussion around separate beds and da 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 and, and agitation being an issue. What time of the day is the person hungry? Are they in pain? Are they feeling isolated, I mean this, I need this, I need this father still, but what's he doing here? I'm with my husband, you know, somebody I can you know, have a good compassionate cuddle with. Tricky, isn't it? So trial and error is going to be the big issue here. Does it really matter? Does some of the behaviours matter? Looking out for side effect for medication, trial of medications, it's often a hand up. You've got to find other mechanisms to help out with that. Timing of the medication, try not to use them all the time, trying to get involved when things you can see that the temperature is rising, that people are getting wound up, then pop it in into the uh, situation as earlier as possible and try not to come in on from behind. You've mm -hmm. got to fight from above, not below. Um, seek the family's involvement and the dementia um, advisors from the societies are very helpful. This is an area where an MHSOP can sometimes be extremely helpful in sorting through options. When to refer, I mentioned this before, I think it ultimately it's up to the primary care person to decide. We will ask you some questions which we think are appropriate, like have you done a cognitive score? Well, I mean, that, I think that's not unreasonable, but if you'd say that we've tried, it's not possible, and I would say for the person I saw today, I mean, she was just catastrophic about every question I asked, so I thought, oh, it's useless, no, don't bother. Yeah. Hello? Where are we getting a summary? Trial the medications is worthwhile. The burden, the anti cholinergic burden can creep up unbeknown to you. And medication management for BPSC, they are sometimes necessary, but very short, sharp, tailored interventions mm -hmm. in association with non pharmacological interventions. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Are you ready for some quick fire Absolutely. Questions? Okay, all right. Without deviation or hesitation. Right. Oh, actually, um, you're going to mention the MOCA score. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, um, I know that many of you will have heard that the MOCA, the tool that comes out of the Montreal stable um, out of Canada, has been monetized effectively by um, expecting people to use it under their licensed, a licensing agreement. In other words, not breaking copyright rules. Mm -hmm. We'll need to have a training program and be involved in a training program. And that is largely self-directed, but it is as prescribed and it does cost a couple of hundred bucks. So in New Zealand, as a representative of New Zealand Inc. As, uh, for the Ministry of Health, I've got a group of people together and we've decided that we prefer not to um, do that. We can think of better ways of spending that money. And we've gone to look for an alternative. We've found an alternative called the Mini ACE. Now, many of you will recognize the word ACE. It's what many of us um, specialists and many people, some people in primary care are using it. I'm amazed, very impressed. It takes a good 15 to 20 minutes to do. So um, a mini ACE takes five, five to 10 minutes max. And I've been using it recently and I'm reasonably impressed. It can be condensed down to a single page, but it is on a two pager. It's a clock drawing test, recall of um, animal names, um, generation of animal names, recall of an address and orientation. That's it. Okay, great. Now, some quick fire questions. So. Just um, with regards to delirium that you mentioned earlier, someone just wants you to clarify, so if an elderly person uh, 
develops delirium from whatever cause, mm. then are they more likely to be in the early stages of or go on to have dementia? Yeah, they are. And the answer is wait and see to a certain extent. I mean, you've treated the delirium and you put it on record, but if they go back completely to normal, then anybody can have a delirium. It just depends on how intense um, that um, insult is. Um, uh, delirium is proportional to the insult. And so if you can um, um, get over that, that's, that shows considerable resilience. But if it's a, a mild UTI and a chest infection and the person's got a delirium and they had another one, they get another one in three months time, then I would be seriously wondering the underlying cognitive performance. Okay. It increases risk by about 50%. Great. Now, what would you suggest for the treatment of depression for those people that have stable hyponatremia? Ah, okay. This is a question in its own right. Um, hyponatremia in an older person, when you've done all the routine exclusions, um, including metabolic disorders, medications, pain, and chronic UTIs and things like that. There is a group of people who are actually on the lower border of the scale. It is a bell-shaped curve. There will be people out on the far left and the low levels. My personal experience is it's a bit of a mugs game to try to give them salt and things like that. But to be frank, they'll just waste it. And mm -hmm. if you really want to go down that track, you know, you can do um, you can do um, early, you can do early morning cortisols and and 24-hour um, sodium excretion and things like that. Um, and uh, in other words, it's an IADH um, uh, diuretic hormone excess and things like that. But um, you might want you might prefer to have a, an endocrinologist or a geriatrician to go through that. It can be quite time consuming. But I've seen primary care dealing with that and I it, it has it has been successful. Um, if you want to do it, um, you just look up um, Med, Med, Medscape or do a Google. You, anybody can do that. It's just a matter of collecting the information and putting it together. Okay. Check the thyroid function test, I think is a good thing. Make sure they're not surreptitiously taking um, um, nutraceuticals that you don't know about. Um, sometimes that's a problem. And polydipsia, in other words, drinking lots and lots of water because they've been told to do so. Um, I can't imagine anybody um, taking illicit lithium compounds. I can't imagine how they do that. Yeah, I usually go through my list and I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a checklist person. I tend to go and look for my list that I've had on my computer for a few years and make sure I go through it. Okay. Can you explain the place of quotypin if there is any place for quotypin? Oh there is. There is I'm I'm aware that people would prefer to go completely um, 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 antipsychotic free and I believe that there was a recent news article um, out of Wellington um, that basically show, um, pointed out that the number of people on uh, antipsychotics had risen outside the proportion they'd expect from a population growth. In other words, it was a lazy man's um, um, uh, uh, padded cell for people in long-term care. Um, I think that's a bit sh that was a bit cruel because, in fact, they didn't even take into account the population rise. I had to point out to them that there was a considerable explanation in that. The second thing is survival has increased. Graduates of antipsychotic use in the long term have increased as well. But I still couldn't be sure that I that we weren't seeing a signal which is indicating quetiapine and, and any other antipsychotic, um, olanzapine, um, risperidone, and so forth. All of those medications have their place in small doses for clear purposes with an intention to monitor, an intention to withdraw as soon as possible, I think is reasonable. I, I do see quite a lot still of people being on these long-term and just forgotten. Okay. I think that's the bad side of it. Mm. So just, do you have any quick comments just to wrap up on Lewy body dementia? Which mm. They often have quite treatable causes, but they react quite sensitively to medication. Yes, they can. And I think um, that's an area where you want to be uh, particularly um, cautious. One of the diagnostic criteria for Lewy body disease, which is um, a deposit of a of synuclein and, and, and other compounds which are associated with Parkinson's. And there's a bit of a mix in there. It's actually not as clear cut as people used to think, um, as opposed to an amyloidopathy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that group is, um, we've done some research on this with um, Dnepazole and, and, try, and tried to demonstrate Parkinson's and Parkinson's dementia and Lewy body disease were similarly treatable with cholinesterase inhibitors. So that in that respect, we were able to show that there was a slight advantage for Lewy body disease and possibly more so than um, with Alzheimer's disease. 
but for Parkinson's dementia, it wasn't that clear cut. Okay. So Parkinson's um, Parkinsonian features are more likely to be found in people um, having Lewy body disease and hallucinations mm -hmm. and treated with antipsychotics. Sensitivity, hypersensitivity to antipsychotics, even the atypical antipsychotics, is a phenomenon associated with Lewy body disease, which includes um, fluctuation, cognitive impairment, falls, and antipsychotic sensitivity. Okay, thank you. Um, it's probably time to wrap up now. I think we've um, filled our session with many good points and many good questions. So thank you very much it's for coming tonight, Phil, and having a chat to us about right. prescribing in dementia. Okay. Just to let everyone know that a copy of this talk will be available in the next day or so on our website. And our next Tuesday night webinar will be on, I think, the 7th of April, and we'll be talking about COPD and aspirin inhalers and giving a bit of an update around that. So thank you, everyone, for watching, and good night. <laughs>